morning. Uh, today in this morning lecture, uh, what I'm going to do is give you sort of brief tour around the different uh, high performance computing libraries that are available. Uh, we are not going to very uh, detailed into how to actually use these libraries. In most cases, uh, it's even it's it's either very trivial. So you just insert few function calls, or it's uh, uh, in context of so-called frameworks, which we discuss at the end. It's a bit complex, uh, something that uh, we cannot actually go through in in such a short time. But the main idea is to give you idea uh, what sort of libraries are available, what they're good for. There are really large, large set of different libraries available, so I, I'm sure I, I won't be covering all of them, but I try to cover some of uh, uh, that I feel are the most important and useful for uh, many different people. To start with the short introduction, to general HPC libraries and why to use them. Then we discuss a bit more detail some uh, particular libraries related to linear algebra, both dense and sparse linear algebra, uh, Fourier transforms, and then some other bit more domain-specific libraries, I.O. libraries, and uh, so-called frameworks, which are somehow more more complex entities containing, uh, in a way, uh, some sort of program model, model themselves, and we'll have some exercises where you can where you can try to use it of uh, some of the most important uh, dense linear algebra libraries. <coughs> and uh, as yesterday, if you have any questions uh, during the lectures, uh, just uh, ask me. <coughs> Well, main motivation for using libraries instead of writing the code for your own is that uh, if someone else has actually already done the work, I mean, there is no sense to reinvent the field. Um, quite often, lots of effort has been put in optimizing the algorithms and the computer code in these libraries. Uh, so. I'm not saying that you cannot get better performance by programming the thing by yourself, but in many cases it requires really a lot of effort to get uh, good performance, while when using libraries you might just insert one function call, one, one procedure call, and get all of that sort of automatically done for you. Bugs are something that uh, I guess uh, all of us always make, at least I do, and as uh, Many people are typically using and testing these libraries. They tend to have fewer bugs than code of your own. They're not bug free. Sometimes it's really irritating when you uh, take into use new library, new version of library, and suddenly you notice that, okay, your code is not working the way it's supposed to be, and might take a while to find out that there was actually some bug in the library. It's not very common. It's much more common that uh, your own code will have bugs, but uh, as any code, they are not totally bug free. Uh, nice thing with libraries is also that even though they are often implemented uh, with some specific programming language, might have an official interface only for one or two programming languages, quite often it's uh, easy to use some of these high performance libraries from uh, other languages and high level languages. For example, you might be working with uh, uh, Python or MATLAB or Perl or something like that. And while the sort of performance you get out from these, these sorts of languages per se is not very good. If you just, it's uh, often relatively easy that for certain numerical operations, you still rely on some high performance libraries. And in that case, in many cases, you can get more or less the same performance from your high-level code than from the actual compiled code and the actual library. 
um, can make the code more portable and sometimes uh, if you want to utilize for example graphics processing units might be that it's enough just to use library which is uh, ported also to GPU so you don't have to do that much work to get at least some speed up on on new hardware. <coughs> Here is one example uh, matrix multiply uh, matrix matrix multiplication is probably the sort of uh, most common example uh, you see that okay whether using of libraries makes sense here is sort of example of uh, performance in terms of uh, uh, floating point units uh, per second in gigaflops depending on matrix size this is something if you do sort of implementation naively yourself by having uh, three uh, four or dual loops uh, if you use the Fortran intrinsic module this is something you might get a little bit, bit better this is naturally something you can do in C and if you use in this case uh, the AMD mathematical library ACML this is sort of performance you can get so you can see that there is a uh, factor of uh, 100 almost in some case even even more the main matrix size in, in terms of performance you can get out of course you can tune your own code here but uh, just think that okay this is one function call compared to three do loops bit code there and you get very good performance and this is one example where actually these libraries they typically give you very close to the peak performance of machines so matrix multiplication in many cases you can get something like 90% of the theoretical peak performance. Sir, what are the axes? I understand the vertical is performance. So this, is, and this is the matrix size. Matrix size and vertical is performance? Yes. What is the definition, please? The performance here is... Not acceleration. This is just uh, the, how many floating point operations per second has been performed. So, uh, I think... Uh, the bigger the better, so... Uh, for time, in, in principle all of this, I mean the amount of floating point operations you are doing here, it depends on the, uh, on the size of the matrix here. And, sorry? There is because of IO, optimized IO. There is no IO in this example, I mean this is just doing matrix multiplication. Well, yeah, okay, sure. Cache is the biggest effect there, sir. Mm -hmm. I mean, it just, uh, the axis here is, if I would uh, just put uh, how much time it takes to make this, it would make the crowd something like, when you grow the matrix, naturally the time grows a lot. This is, I think this is uh, somehow easier, easy to understand. Probably the sort of theoretical maximum performance in this particular CPU would be something like this. It would be constant here, somewhere around here. This is by, by the fact that what is the clock frequency of the processor, how many instructions per clock cycle it can do. It's, it's the sort of absolute best that it can do. And this is now that what you can achieve in practice. This is something with the library and this is something that you you can get when you do by yourself and if you want to sort of uh, convert that to absolute time okay both of these would have the sort of same number of floating point operations so the difference in time is just same or the ratio in different uh, with the times is just the same as the ratio within the uh, gigaflops in this and this case so it takes also in time this can take uh, 100 times less time than this one here. <clears throat> so
So what you should consider when choosing the libraries? Um, there are different issues. Of course, first you sort of have to find different options for your particular problem. Then uh, here performance has been listed first, I think. Accuracy, that actually should be the first concern. There might be some situations that uh, there are problems in accuracy with one library. And even though in context of HPC, I think we are always speaking about performance and how fast you can do things at the end. What we want to use HPC for is for science. And for science, we want that the results are actually OK. They're accurate. So accuracy, is, if there are some issues, comes first. Performance is a big factor. But sometimes it's also that what's the sort of uh, licensing and pricing of the library. So there are freely available libraries. There are also libraries that you have to pay for. And um, sometimes it might be that you actually have to pay quite a lot of, for them. And that's one decision you have to make that uh, whether you want to use library that is freely available or not. Uh, related to fact is that, OK, if it's some um, free available libraries that tend to be available in many different uh, architectures and be easy to port. Uh, some proprietary libraries might be that they are not that widely available, so portability is not necessarily that, that good. E ease of use is uh, one issue. If there are uh, similar libraries with uh, different ways how to actually, how much things you have to set up, how many parameters you have to supply when you call them, that's maybe something to consider. And parallelization and scalability, that's of course linked to the, to the performance. So some libraries are sort of ready to use for parallel computing. And there might be difference on uh, how well they, they scale in parallel. So let's discuss. Yes? The advantage is also to use the library for the, the serial part, even. Because if you reduce the, ser the time for the serial part, you will get better acceleration. Sure. I mean, it's, it's definitely true. So it, it's not only for parallel, parallel parts. So only sort of bad thing in using libraries uh, is that uh, if you sort of want to measure the parallel scalability of your code, and you would like to show that, OK, this scales very nicely, that you get nice speed up when you increase the number of CPUs. Probably what happens is that if you switch from using your uh, own implementation or some bad library, the good library, the serial part gets so much faster that the parallel scalability gets worse. But of course, the actual wall clock time you spend in doing the calculation, it, it decreases. So that's that's, that's, of course, at the end something, the, the real thing that you, you want to achieve. Parallel scalability should be no sort of ultimate goal. Ultimate goal should be get results as fast as possible. <coughs> um, probably the sort of uh, application area where the interfaces and usage of libraries is, uh, has a, the sort of most standard way. And there, I think the recommendation is quite clear that you should use libraries is in dense linear algebra. And there used to be, I think this, there was this effort started in early 80s, maybe even, even 70s, for developing a standard interface uh, for many common uh, vector vector, matrix vector, and matrix matrix operations involving dense matrices. And these were sort of invented in so-called netlib uh, libraries, most importantly in PLUS, basic linear algebra subroutines, which is really this uh, basic vector vector, uh, matrix vector, matrix matrix operations, and LAPAC, uh, which is then uh, sort of linear algebra package for 
solution of linear equations, matrix diagonalization, factorization, and these kind of things with. Uh, all of these have sort of uh, freely available implementations from this uh, Netlib address. Uh, there are also many, many sort of uh, very hardware optimized implementations. Uh, some of these are freely available. There is uh, Atlas. Uh, Godot Plus is no longer developed, but there is now Open Plus. There is ACML. There is Intel MKL. So this is something that practically any HPC system you will be using has already installed some of these uh, packages for Plus and Labac. Uh, they have also sort of parallel counterparts in uh, B Plus and Scalapack. We discussed them also, also a bit. Uh, they are something that are developed for distributed computing. Uh, here is sort of schematic of this whole Netlib ecosystem. So the real building block there is this uh, plus, so the matrix matrix operations and so on. And for example, this uh, LAPAC, when you solve linear equations with LAPAC or diagonalized matrices, they all rely on these operations implemented in plus. And similarly, the sort of uh, parallel versions here, they rely on a specific uh, communication layer for matrices here called PLAX, uh, which relies on typically on MPI, and then this also relies on this serial, serial PLUS. Uh, there are typically also multi threaded versions of this available. Yes? So if I, I have uh, dense matrices that I would like to diagonalize. Yes. Uh, so I would like to do it in parallel. Yes. It's uh, possible to do it with this library, like uh, L, uh, uh, plus or something like with, uh, with Scala Pack, for example, yes, you can do that. You have to do some work yourself or actually uh, distributing the matrix to different processors. But once you have done the distribution by yourself, then you can have, uh, in principle, just single call to library, and it will do the diagonalization in parallel using MPI for exchanging uh, or communicating between, between the processors as, as needed for the, uh, for the actual algorithm. So the tricky part will be the uh, distribution of the matrix, that which you have to do yourself. But then, then after you have done that and described the uh, distribution, then using the library is, is very straightforward. Uh, this uh, plus, they can be divided in three different levels. There are these vector vector operations in plus one, uh, matrix vector, and matrix matrix. And you can also see that these are something like a, they are typically uh, memory bound algorithms. So memory references here per. Uh, uh, operation is something like 3n, while the actual floating point operations here is also proportional to n. Here it's also, it's, uh, this is proportional to n, n square, memory reference, and also the computational intensity is n square. And uh, while for this matrix matrix operations, okay, the memory reference still scale quadratically with num matrix dimension, while the actual computation scale is cubically, so it's n uh, to the power 3. And that's also something that uh, makes this not memory bound, but compute bound, if you are able to re uh, utilize the cache hierarchy correctly. And this is one reason why, with, uh, for example, with DHM, it's typically possible to get very high percentage of uh, the theoretical peak performance. And uh, because of this, sometimes, in, depending on your algorithm, it might be that you you can write it in a little bit different ways and use different levels of these plus one, two, or three level routines. But because this is really the most efficient one, if possible, if it fits into algorithm, it's a good idea to try to use this DGM. 
Also, it means that uh, if your algorithm is possible to write in terms of uh, dense matrix multiplications, you typically can get very good performance for your application by relying on this, this routine. <coughs> okay, before discussing LAPAC, I probably could show you a very simple demo how to use this uh, plus library. And uh, if you are using a Fortran, it's in principle very straightforward. You just go and some proper reference in it and see what's the, <coughs> what's the interface there. Uh, in principle, there is uh, in plus, uh, there are the sort of basic implementation and the basic interface that's for Fortran 77. There is in principle also C interface and Fortran 90 interface, but they are not always available in all plus libraries. I think the situation has getting getting better. For example, ACML used to be so that okay, it uh, it had some C interface, but that was not the standard one. So you had to have a different C calls whether you were using ACML or some other routines. And that's one reason why, for example, I typically have been using also from C code these Fortran 77 interface because that generally has been the most portable way to use them. And that introduces few sort of quirks, so might be good idea to try to look. Look what you have to do in order to use this. Um, okay, so this is now simple C code, we just put some vector uh, length here. I have some my uh, own timing routine here. And now in order to use, there are no sort of uh, plus dates headers generally available. So one should make their sort of own headers or declare what's the actual function interface here going to be. And because we are about to call a Fortran routine from C, uh, in most uh, linkers and or so, there will be this uh, underscore uh, added there. So when you call call from C, you should add this underscore here. That's not universal. There are some libraries that this is actually missing. So it might be that if you want to make really portable code, you might want to put some C. Uh, three processor definitions that whether one should be using this underscore or not. But in most cases, I think in some IBM libraries there are no this underscore, but this is something. That I haven't run into, but I, I'm sure there are some of these. And then because in Fortran, uh, the arguments are always passed by reference when we are calling from C, all the sort of arguments here, they will be pointers. So we always have to pass pointers here. Okay, I create here some uh, two vectors, some, some scalar here, make some initialization to, to them, and then want to call this routine. So what this uh, uh, AX PY does is, okay, multiply vector X by A and add to the vector y. So we have here the two vectors, um, x and y, and then some scalar here. Now, because we actually have to pass some of these uh, arguments here, so the n here, that now just the dimension of the vector, and this uh, ink x and ink y is theory for the purpose that sometimes you, you don't want to apply the operation for the whole, whole vectors, but have some sort of strides in them so that you, some cases might want to do the operation only for every second element or so. So it's possible to specify here that some sort of stride. Because we have to sort of pass them as, uh, as a pointers, we have actually to create the variables here. So let's make first a dimension. 
and then the x increment we will be just using one and then the uh, y increment then we make the actual call here with the underscore and now really we have to pass the pointers there so this is the matrix dimension uh, this is the constant we want to multiply x with and then we have the actual x okay now because it's a array this uh, this is already pointer we give the x increment y vector and the y increment so this is sort of operation which is not very difficult to do by yourself it's just single for loop and because it's memory bound it's something that you do not necessarily get that much better performance with the, with the plus but it's it's simple example here so now we should compile that we can of course try to use uh, GCC uh, okay I have some C99 constructs there but of course there is no problem that uh, it doesn't know about this routine so uh, we have to sort of provide correct linker flags and that's typical the sort of thing that when you move to a new new computer one first things to find out is that okay how to actually use what plus libraries are available how to use them there what that proper linker flags there uh, can here in Euclid for example say module avail okay demo effect network down or something I don't know okay we get something here and you can see that there is for example this uh, open plus is available here uh, there seems to be also uh, Intel MKL seem to be also Intel compilers available uh, for this example I think uh, if you're using Intel compilers using MKL is uh, very very easy so instead of GCC I will actually use the Intel C compiler and I know that okay with the Intel C compiler I can just pass minus MKL flag and it will then use the MKL library uh, probably for some reason I think when I tried this in a hotel it, I didn't need to load the module but uh, so what was it was use ICTCE that will load your MKL as well. ICTCE. ICTCE. That, that load yeah, this is probably some Intel compiling environment. Yeah, it basically loads everything. Okay. We can try to, and okay, now it compiles. We can try to run it. And actually by default this uh, MKL it will link in a multi-threaded version of plus so in principle if I specify here uh, OMP num threads uh, the performance should vary a bit this is very fast operation so there's maybe not that much difference here in this particular case but it might be just a random variation but in, in principle it's, it's now multi-threaded if you want to use sequential one um, you can add this sort of uh, argument there and then then it won't be multi-threaded yes uh, excuse me for the next question why is this pain of loading the module for example if you have some library you can call any subroutine from that library I think also all these available modules uh, why they are not uh, why it is not able is it just uh, to say which kind of library you are using and you will just get it why you have to load the model 
main reason is that There might be also some conflicts, so depending a little bit sometimes which compiler you are using, whether you are using a GCC or Intel compiler, it might be that you might need a bit different version of the library. It, it really depends. And therefore it's so typically also sort of good practice that not, uh, I mean, you have to load the proper module so that uh, all the sort of uh, dependencies and so on uh, fulfilled correctly and you get the correct version because it's mainly a versioning issue that there might be different versions of libraries. So all you need to remember that this is multi-user system. Yeah. We, we have to start with this. I mean that, that that's something. When you when you start to use some new system, uh, you in most cases it, it's not always this module environment that the uh, people are using or, or the system is using. But there is typically some module is very common nowadays. There is typically some sort of way how to how to set up some paths, library paths, library flags, and so what you have to do is sort of find out that what what sort of module commands you have to do, and also if uh, instead of uh, this Intel MKL, we could in principle also try to use uh, uh, this Open Plus. Uh, problem is that uh, with OpenPlus it actually it's not that easy <coughs> to compile. If I just try to give this uh, OpenPlus here, it does not uh, find. So we actually have to also provide the location of the library, and we can get some hints by looking what this uh, OpenPlus module actually. Yeah, so okay, we know that it sets up some uh, library paths, some other paths here, but it cannot sort of in automatic way tell the compiler that uh, which is the proper library path. But we can we can see here that okay, this seems to be location of the libraries, so we can actually copy paste that, and with minus capital L, we can give the correct library path there, and now our code has been compiled or linked against open plus. So instead of Intel MKL, we are using a different uh, different implementation of, of the same routine. And we can see that actually seems to be much better than. OK. Open plus, uh, I don't know how. For, Typically, I just test the DHM, and for DHM, I think both OpenPlus and MKL give more or less similar performance. Yeah. DHM is also something that is, if you look all these sort of uh, hardware or library benchmarks, it's it's the one that used there. So typically, the vendors, that's the one routine they spend most of the effort on. So this actually might be just that Intel hasn't put that much effort on on this. Uh, uh, DXPY and open plus more. I, I don't really know, but at least in this particular case, it seems to be faster. Which maybe also gives you a hint that it might be a good idea try different libraries and see what performs best in your particular. You can make in exercise. I mean, you have, you have the skeleton available for matrix multiplication, so you can, you can try to do that and try to sort of first yourself try to find out that then or remember what were the proper flags to link these but but you have you have the sort of skeleton and also the actual answer available for very similar thing <clears throat> so this is as i say this is probably the sort of uh, uh, the most standard hpc library uh, available in, in many systems together with, uh, with LAPAC. Uh, and 
in many cases, they are sort of shipped together in the, in the same library. So OpenPlus contains both LabAC routines and PLAS routines, as well as MKL. In some other implementations, it might be that there are different libraries, so you might need to add both minus L plus and minus L LAPAC in order to use LAPAC. And what this LAPAC really does, as, as, I, as I mentioned, it has matrix solvers, linear equation, least square solutions, eigenvalue problems, factorization, and it really relies heavily on PLAS for computation. But usage is in principle very simple. You, you have the matrices by yourself, and then you just call the proper LAPAC routine and you get, for example, the eigenvectors or the eigenvalues of, uh, of the matrix with the single library call without the need to actually try to implement that on your own, try to optimize that on your own. <coughs> uh, pack, <coughs> as mentioned, is the sort of uh, Parallel version of LAPAC. Uh, it uh, relies on this uh, uh, very basic message passing layer. So basically, that operates just with uh, two day arrays on 2D process grids. And there are some routines of uh, communication specific, communication to specific for matrices. In many cases, you don't really use these plaques in communication by yourself, but it's uh, you might have to create some process scripts if you want to use uh, scalar pack or, or B plus. <coughs> Here are some sort of uh, new forthcoming plus and LAPAC implementation. Plus is something that is uh, uh, really try to optimize the code for many core architectures. And mark my something which uh, tries to do the same thing for GPUs. Uh, NVIDIA provides a Q plus library to be used with CUDA programs on NVIDIA GPUs. This tries to be a bit more, more general, but I, uh, I haven't actually tried that myself for, for some time, so I'm not sure what's the status. If it, is it still sort of uh, production quality or more for development thing? But Maybe something which is interesting to know if you are wanting to work with the GPUs. Is this CUDA? Uh, I think this uses OpenCL. As far as I know, it's not uh, only for NVIDIA, it should be more general. <coughs> um, dense linear algebra is something which is, uh, in a way, relatively simple, and there is this. Uh, standard netlib infrastructure. Um, if you are working with sparse matrices, which uh, often arise from, uh, uh, for example, stencil type solution to partial differential equations, some network simulation and so, uh, things are a bit more tricky. What's available, uh, what's the efficiency, what to use. Uh, also, in, in terms of performance, uh, dense linear algebra is, uh, is quite straightforward. Here to actually what's the sparsity pattern, uh, that affects a lot of performance. It also makes, uh, with, with sparse matrix problems, you typically don't want to solve all your elements of the matrix. So if there are enough zeros, it doesn't make sense to store them. It just makes store, sense to store non-zero values, but then you need some mapping that what matrix indices are non-zeros. And there are different sort of formats how to do this mapping and how to store the matrix in memory. And depending on the sparsity pattern uh, and type of application, uh, different storage formats uh, might, be <coughs> uh, might be usable. And there is, real, there is no single general purpose solution, both for, for the methods to use and for the uh, uh, storage format. Uh, the way to solve uh, linear equations or eigenvalue problems with sparse matrices uh, rely typically on uh, iterative methods and uh, 
In many cases, uh, these iterative methods, they are based on sparse matrix vector multiplications. So in many libraries, what you sort of have to define yourself is that how to actually perform uh, your sparse matrix times vector product, and then the library might be able to do the actual iterative algorithm based on this. So in a simple way, you can, you can say that you define a function, and then you pass function pointer uh, to, the, to the library, which, which kind of matrix vector product routine to use. There are quite large multitude of uh, different uh, sparse matrix libraries available. So, as I mentioned, with dense linear algebra, there is more or less at least the interface is standard, even though the implementations vary. Here, there are no sort of standard interface and many, many different implementations. There is something called Hypre. In part of Trillinos, there are KLU, Stecco. As you can see, there are quite many different, different one of these. And once again, if you want to, or if you're doing some sparse uh, matrix operations in your application, in principle, you just have to try to look through these different libraries, whether some of these might be useful in your particular case. <coughs> um, FFTs, fast Fourier transforms, uh, from sort of uh, performance and usage point of view, they are a bit more straightforward than, than sparse matrices. But uh, still, for some reason, there hasn't been any standardized uh, application problem interface for fast Fourier transforms. So in principle, I would say practically all different FFT implementations have a bit different call interface. So when you're using PLUS, it's in a way, very easy to program. You always have the same function calls. And in, then, depending on the implementation you're using, you just have to make the, in a, in a phase when you're building your code in compiling and linking, you have to make the choice. Uh, with FFTs, you typically have to make some sort of choice already when you're making the actual program. You have to choose that, what, uh, what API you want to use. <coughs> Many of them have uh, some similarities. So in many cases, in a sort of initial phase of the program, you create a plan. That's typically something where you give the FFT library idea that what's the dimension of your uh, FFT grid, and maybe also a bit what type of FFT, uh, one, two, or one, two, or three D uh, inverse or direct or whatever you want to do. Uh, is, is going to take place. And then there is the actual execution phase and which can sort of uh, reuse the plan. So plan is uh, created uh, on one for certain FFT parameters and then used for several or different executions. Um, performance of FFT very often depends on what's the actual size of the FFT grid. And, uh, I think some libraries might even have limitations that what you can use, whether you can use general numbers. But uh, typically, if you have powers of single factor, uh, they typically work well. If you have powers of two, that's, I think, in most cases, the so really efficient one. Here are some examples of uh, FFT libraries available. FFTW is probably the sort of uh, most most standard FFT library, it's available in many systems. It's, it's freely available. And it has lots of functionality. It has uh, both uh, or all, all 1, 2, and D, uh, 3D versions. Can work with uh, real and complex numbers. Uh, there is also, I think, uh, there is a multi-threaded version. And there is parallel version in FFTW Two. I think in most recent version of FTW3, there is actually also MPI version available. But uh, depends a bit on your system whether, whether there is the most recent version available. And it really has also this, this approach that first you create a plan, and then you use this plan 
for actual execution of, of FFT. <coughs> and uh, typically the performance is, is quite good that you can obtain from this FFTW. Uh, Cray has their own FFT implementation, which uh, where you have also a parallel option using MPI. AMD has some, Intel MKL has some also FFT functionality. And there are also some FFT libraries for GPUs available in, in, in CU FFT. Yes? Uh, FFT libraries. Uh, for FFT, no. Uh, I'm not sure if I have for for scale up. I, that's something I have used also myself a bit. Uh, I think the probably best way you can go to the uh, netlib and find the scale up documentation, and there you should have some example code. The tricky part there is, as I said, is really uh, how you uh, distribute your matrix to the processors and how you describe this distribution. And I think it's something that I, I won't have sort of time to really go through here. It's, uh, it's a bit complex. It's, it's not something that it's, it's very difficult to do, but it probably will take uh, uh, 20 minutes to go through and explain what's, what's needed there. But uh, if you're interested uh, during the exercise session, we can try to look some, through some example. <coughs> uh, there are some very domain-specific libraries available. So if you're doing molecular dynamics, there is something called OpenMM, which has many common routines used in molecular dynamics uh, implemented. Uh, it also supports GPUs. I think there is also some MPI functionality there uh, for molecular integrals in quantum chemistry. Uh, uh, sort of two-body integrals, there is some library available. There are for flight dynamics, there is over two library containing some partial differential equation solvers. Uh, for bioinformatics, there are some genome analysis tools available. Uh, for the sort of uh, uh, distributing the work, making the decomposition, that's in some cases if you have a regular two or three dimensional grid, the decomposition is typically very easy. But if you have a sort of uh, more complex uh, uh, problem domain or structure in, in your problem, it might be that it's not so trivial to get uh, uh, good load balancing and distribution where the communication is sort of optimal so that you have a, uh, as few communication events as possible. And there are some <coughs> libraries available for sort of helping in doing this uh, partitioning. Metis and Parmetis is uh, one of these uh, quite popular. It can do some craft and uh, mesh partitioning, also some adaptive refined meshes. Uh, and you really can also use that in parallel. <coughs> Zoltan is uh, another option. And uh, that's also basically for unstructured or dynamic computations. And it's part of Trillinos. Can also be used as standalone. And you can call it from, from C and Fortran. And it's, it's also sort of a parallel library, so you can use it for parallel decomposition of your, of your unstructured data. <coughs> uh, yesterday, we discussed uh, a bit the input and output issues and how to do the input and output efficiently with MPIIO. Um, as mentioned, uh, if the data is something that uh, uh, you also want to utilize later on in easy to use manner, it might be that instead of uh, MPIIO, it's better to use some of these IO libraries. And uh, one popular option is uh, 
HDF5, which in a way is both, uh, it's a data model, so there is some hierarchical uh, way to store the data. It's a library implementation, it's also a file format. And it can store, most often it's used for storing multidimensional arrays. It can store also more general objects or complex objects. And it's easy to attach some metadata to the actual uh, multidimensional arrays you're working with. The file format and files are portable. That's one of the nice things. So if you are creating HDF file, uh, file in uh, some IBM blue chain machine, for example, uh, yeah. and work to some Linux cluster, which have a different NDNS in the format, you can just use the same, same file without any problem. And the library, uh, in, in principle, and the file format takes care of that things. You can do parallel I.O. relatively straightforward manner. It, it's built on top of MPAIO and the sort of basic concepts uh, we discussed with the MPAIO, uh, how you can sort of uh, uh, define parts of file you want to write to, whether you do common to I.O. in independent and collective manner, they both apply also when you are using HDF5. <coughs> um, there are Fortran and C and C++. Uh, I think, uh, and also in the Java interface within the sort of official distribution, but you can read and use these files also easily. There is uh, some Python bindings. MATLAB can directly read HDF5 files, and many visualization software can also directly read these files. Uh, it's not very difficult to start to use HDF5, uh, but there are some things you have to do. Uh, the data model and library are a bit complex, but uh, I would say that uh, it would take probably, if you haven't been using HDF5 before, in one day you can easily learn that by yourself. In a one, two hour lecture, I could probably very, very easily teach you how to, how to use that in a relatively efficient manner. NetCDF is uh, another popular file format. It's maybe more used by geoscientists. <coughs> and it, basic idea is it's quite similar. It doesn't have the uh, same, same kind of hierarchy than HDF5, uh, but it well, so it's quite well uh, for working with large data sets. And actually version 4 is implemented in top of HDF5. There is also parallel version available and once again, built on top of MPI IO. <clears throat> okay, as a sort of final topic, I discuss with these uh, more complex entities, uh, which are called frameworks. And they are something that uh, instead of uh, providing a sort of uh, limited set of routines, they typically contain large collection of routines and not just for solving something, but also sometimes uh, how to store the data, how to decompose the data, and so on. Uh, the different parts in these frameworks, they are typically well integrated and might be that, uh, for example, the, uh, if you want to use them in parallel, the decomposition of data can be done not in automatic fashion, but uh, quite transparently by using these, uh, these frameworks. And after that, <coughs> you can use matrix solvers uh, practically with one or two function calls. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, the sort of... Uh, Advantages and this, and typically, if you start to use some <coughs> a single library, in most cases, it means that okay, you don't really have to design your whole application around that library. You can just select few routines. Uh, but uh, once you start to use these uh, frameworks, it might be that uh, 
in some cases you, you really have to design your application from scratch that, okay, it's built around this framework, how you store your data, how you solve it, and so on. <coughs> Which makes that, okay, you will have a quite strong dependency on the, on the selected approach. Pros are, of course, that, okay, there are many things done already for you. You don't have to apply, apply them themselves. Sometimes, nice thing is that, let's say you're doing some uh, uh, sparse matrix things, and there are a multitude of different iterative solvers that, uh, that can be used for a particular problem, whether it be a uh, conjugate gradient or <coughs> Jacobi Davidson or whatever. And with these frameworks, it sometimes can be as easy as uh, changing one uh, common line parameter when you execute your application to try to use different solver. So it's very easy to experiment with, with different solvers and see what suits best your particular problem. Uh, Petsy is uh, one such an example. Especially with Petsy, you can really on command line, you can, you can specify that what solvers you want to use. Of course, in your program code, you can make some defaults. And it's mainly targeted for partial differential equations. And it contains uh, data structures for sparse matrices and routines for solving them. And it truly really defines, in a way, programming model of its own. Uh, it has Sophistical C and Fortran interfaces, and it's really designed for large-scale parallelism. Uh, here you can see sort of uh, uh, sketch of the of the whole Petsy architecture. So there are presentation of vectors. There are different type of matrices. Uh, you have a large set of uh, preconditioners which can work with any type of these matrices. Same, you have different uh, solvers here, nonlinear solvers. And basically, once you're done to choose that, okay, I want to use Petsy, you can choose any of the sort of vector representation, matrix representation, uh, or solution method very easily. So it gives lots of flexibility. In many cases, also very efficient implementation. And it's relatively easy to get all this done uh, in parallel with MPI. There is, yes? The Petsy uh, can be compiled to different uh, MPI tables. And uh, I know that it can be different uh, performance or even some things do work or don't work. Uh, can you uh, comment on this? Uh, I have not that much personal experience on Petsy and using that, so I. I don't know how much the performance varies, but I'm sure there can be these kind of issues that it, it really depends also on the underlying MPI implementation. It performance also will depend on uh, what kind of uh, storage format you choose for your matrices and probably also for the, uh, for the methods. So uh, unfortunately, I, I, I'm sorry I cannot give any more specific answer to that. There is separate versions of uh, Petsy for real and complex numbers. So actually, if you have an application which uses both uh, real numbers and complex numbers, it will be very difficult to use Petsy because there are separate library for this. And that actually, at some point in one of the applications I was working with, I was really interested in Petsy, but because in same applications we used both real and complex, it didn't really fit. That so well. Uh, another basically uh, framework having similar idea, so targeted for uh, sparse systems, sparse linear systems is uh, Trilinos. Uh, I think Trilinos provides a C plus plus interface. It can be of course used also from C. <coughs> it's maybe a bit uh, uh, less densely connected set of packages than Petsy, but uh, it's, it's really comprehensive. I think there are over different, uh, over 50 different modules for different tasks there, uh, starting from mesh partitioning and also storage formats to <coughs> different, different solvers. <coughs> and it really also has been designed 
uh, from beginning to be used on a massively parallel scale using distributed memory model and typically MPI as, as the backend. <coughs> um, as there are so many packages, many of them are actually something that you don't have to use the whole framework, so they can be self-contained. <coughs> and sometimes you can just sort of build, you don't have to build the whole framework in order to use it, so you can, you can just select a subset of Trillinos you, you find interesting. Um, licensing is quite, uh, quite uh, liberal, so it can be used practically in any, any program without limitations. Okay, <clears throat> to summarize, a sort of uh, most important message I think is that uh, if possible, try to use some library. That is especially true if you're doing dense linear algebra. There is a standard interface in the Netlib framework for PLAS and LAPAC, also for Scalapack, <laughs> and you can easily choose or different implementations depending which uh, computer system you're running, but you don't have to change your program code in order to use different these. Um, for, let's say, uh, other disciplines, whether it's uh, fast Fourier transforms <coughs> or sparse linear algebra, you probably have to do a bit more research to see see the sort of available options and what suits best for you. But uh, still also in this case, if there is library that seems to be well available on the systems you are planning to use uh, and seems to fulfill your needs, it's always a good idea to try to use, uh, use these libraries. And still a sort of final point, even though these libraries are very useful, uh, there is still no single library or framework which really covers everything. So in many cases you might need that, okay, you take a bit and pieces here and there and combine them in your actual program code. Do you have any questions about libraries now? Okay. Then as, uh, as the sort of uh, plus, and in a way, LAPAC is also, in my opinion, quite fundamental in, in this. I don't know, are there actually, how many of you are using uh, dense linear algebra in the application you are doing? Okay, only so few. Are there, uh, other way, how many of you know that you are, won't be using any dense linear algebra? <laughs> okay, so many of you actually might have some possibilities. So. That's good because for the sort of exercises, uh, the idea is actually now just try to use a bit, uh, <coughs> see how you actually use this DHM routine and then a bit how you can use LAPAC routines for some, some simple tasks. And you should have the skeleton code available so the matrices and so are already there. So in principle, what you should now try to do is look, for example, in Netlib or some other web resource and see how to, for example, call this matrix multiplication with DHM or how to do a uh, solution of linear system or eigenvalue problem, problem with LAPAC. And also try to look that, okay, uh, if you're doing in Euclid, Try to remember what you need to do in order to link in the correct libraries or if you want to try some of your own system, try to find out that how to use PLAS and LAPAC in that particular system. <coughs> I wanted to ask about uh, Matlam. Yeah? I know that Matlam has uh, you know, power four and things like that. Mm -hmm. But uh, as far as I know, it's only if you have just on my com computer or you know, just one node yeah. that the memory is shared, then MATLAB can do it without a problem. Yeah, <coughs> I think so. But do you know if they have like a parallel, 
if I have many mm -hmm. many nodes, the MATLAB has the ability to. I think there is some. I don't know if it's how standard it is, but I think in principle there is some possibility to use MATLAB also in sort of distributed memory mm -hmm. environment, but uh, oh, it's not possible. Okay. Sorry? Oh, I know, I know that. It's all right. It's yeah, we have it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if you ever managed to, to, to do the math of the two boxes with MPI, I mean, between nodes? Or? I could only get it to work within the... Yeah, I did that. I did the MATLAB with only Maybe one node so. on my CPU to run yeah. and part of it. So part of the toolbox works. Yeah, yeah. but so if you have many nodes... Yeah. Then you but the distributed server is supposed to work with the... <coughs> I mean, that's, I, have, I have no experience on that myself, but uh, I have also sort of idea that in principle, with a specific product, it's, it's possible. But uh, how well it works in practice, and whether it truly is the way to go, okay, that's maybe more more matter for discussion. That uh, I think MATLAB is good for prototyping and doing simple things. But if you really need to do really high performance computing, I'm not sure whether MATLAB is the correct choice. But that's my opinion. I mean, it's it's. <laughs>